Hi, I'm Steve Clemens, and I have a question. Will the coronavirus pandemic be the tipping point that takes us into years of joblessness and poverty? Let's get to the bottom line. When we look around, we see a lot of people who can't find work and a lot of businesses that have gone bust. But there are some winners out there. It seems like the financial markets are always winning, at least from my vantage point. Economists usually say that they saw what was coming after the fact. There are always rationalizations for the ups and downs of markets or of jobless rates, of consumer and business confidence. But let's take a look at the big picture. My guest today is not afraid to go where many economists won't and to look at the key factors out there that predict a really serious financial and to some degree even social and environmental meltdown affecting each and every one of us all over the world. He's not known as Dr. Doom for nothing. Nouriel Roubini predicted the U.S. real estate market crash three years before everything came tumbling down in 2008. Professor Rubini teaches economics and international business at New York University, and he joins us from New York today. Nouriel, thanks so much for joining us. I was very, very taken with Main Street Manifesto. It, it seemed to sort of break through the noise that there is a stacked deck against people on a lot of fronts well before the pandemic hit. And the pandemic is, in a sense, sped up history, and you continue to find people um, that are not going to be winners in this, and the system slowly coming undone even if there are flirtations with what looks like, you know, uh, uh, growth, et cetera. Tell us what the, the real message behind Main Street Manifesto was. Well, the reality is that uh, globalization, trade, migration, technology, and many factors have led to an increase in income and wealth inequality. Uh, after the global financial crisis, uh, firms slash jobs, and when they started to rehire people, there were not full-time jobs uh, uh, with formal employment and full benefits. They were mostly contractors, freelancers, gig workers, hourly workers, part-time workers. So we had a huge amount of uh, job and income uncertainty for labor. The share of profit has gone up. The share of labor income has fallen. And this time around, I think it's going to be even worse because the conditions of the corporate sector today are much worse than they were after the global financial crisis. So we have shed in three months in the US more jobs than we created in the previous 10 years. And I think it'll be a repeat of the same. If and when firms are gonna to start to hire again, it's gonna be in ways that essentially are precarious jobs that are part-time, that are hourly, that are gig work and so on and so on. So we've created a vast underclass of what uh, an economist guy standing uh, called the precariat instead of the proletariat. They're young people, and they're not just necessarily minorities like African-Americans or Latinos. There is a vast underclass of white America that is uh, jobless, incomeless, skillless, hopeless, helpless, with debt, no assets. And these are actually struggling as much as anybody else. We've had the opioid epidemic in the United States with 80,000 young people dying every year of opioid overdose, and a, a majority of them are actually this, part of this white underclass. So when I saw these uh, pro protests and demonstration, even riots after the killing of uh, George Floyd, yes, it was about uh, Black Lives Matter. It was also about uh, racial justice, but was also about economic justice. I live in neighborhood in New York where every day there were demonstrations with thousands of young kids going and protesting. And actually, almost 80% of them were white. They were not black and Latino only, because there is this vast underclass of young people that are alienated, are frustrated, they don't have jobs, they have precarious jobs, and they feel that there is no future for them. So it's a revolution of the precariat rather than the Marxian proletariat. Well, you and Thomas Piketty, and there are a number of other writers, as you just mentioned, who, who would, uh, the, the writer who mentioned Precariat, ha have seen these tensions, these economic tensions. But the, main, the, the mainstream of economics, those uh, 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 out there every day investing in the markets, talking about, you know, 4 million new jobs being created, even though 44 million people are unemployed officially from this. What does it take the economics profession to get beyond these blind spots so that that they see what you see well you know many people looking only at the stock market uh, but wall street and main street have different interests wall street represents uh, big firms big tech 
uh, big banks, while Main Street is households, is workers, and is uh, small businesses. And what's good for Wall Street, unfortunately, is bad for Main Street, because the way most firms are going to survive and thrive and achieve the earnings target of Wall Street or the city is by slashing uh, cost. And what are the costs that are slashing? The initially labor costs. But your labor cost is my labor income and my consumption. And, you know, and S&P 500 is going to newer highs because the big firms are going to become bigger while millions of small businesses, retail shops, small enterprises are going to go bust and the market share of big tech and big business is going to rise. So people usually think that Wall Street and Main Street have the same interest, but we have a really a social caste conflict right now. What's good for Wall Street is bad, bad for Main Street. And unfortunately, if we don't have changes in economic policy in a more direction that is progressive and inclusive, then the success of Wall Street is going to come at the expense of Main Street. And what's happening right now is that those who are suffering are workers, are consumers, are households, are small businesses, while big business is becoming even more powerful, even more oligopolistic, even more concentration of economic, financial, and other types of political power. Now, you have written um, that globalization is coming apart, that nationalism is rising, walls are back, it's going to be harder to move people and ideas and money and institutions across lines um, like used to be the case. Is this not a possible fix for the Main Street problem? Doesn't this move an economy to begin looking at what you need in your own economy as opposed to buying it cheaply somewhere else or in a place that has low environmental regulations? Well, it can if it's done in a progressive and intelligent way. Uh, in many ways, uh, protection is, first of all, hurts uh, workers as consumers because it increases the price of imported goods uh, cheaply from China and Asia. So as a consumer, you're going to be worse off. So it's a very regressive tax. Uh, two, even if we are going to have a reshoring of economic activity from China to the United States, big business is going to decide to have factories that are fully automated with robots. So we may create more production, more profits. I'm not sure we're going to create jobs unless we have seen incentives to create uh, labor and jobs in these kind of things. And, uh, and migration in many ways uh, uh, is good for America, has brought uh, entrepreneurship, has brought people that have initiative, has brought people like myself and others who have contributed to society. So putting a wall of tariffs and a wall of blocking migration doesn't resolve the fundamental problem that people need education, need skills, need the human capital and need to survive and thrive in a digital and globalized economy. And by the way, even if tomorrow we were to have a wall so nobody can get in the United States, even if we had 100 percent tariff on foreign goods, technology in the future is going to disrupt many jobs more than migration or globalization and trade. I'll give you one example. If and when we have autonomous vehicles, you'll have millions of Uber or Lyft drivers they are going to be without jobs. You'll have millions of uh, truck drivers that are not going to have jobs. So in the next 10 years, technology rather than trade or globalization or migration is going to be the big disruptor of income and jobs and uh, working incomes. So we have to think about how we make sure that people can survive and thrive in this digital economy. Otherwise, we're fighting the wars of the past rather than the wars of the future. Look, you worked in the Clinton White House. In fact, I think I first met you when you worked in uh, the National Economic Council in the Clinton White House. Um, I was in the Senate at the time. So you know how this town works. You know about policy and politics. Um, and I've been fascinated by, you know, the bravado of Donald Trump on one hand, being the populist president, ostensibly responding to these workers you just talked about who fear for their jobs, who fear for their families, but yet you said he's not that at all. Well, you know, Iran is a populist, but once in power, he is governed as a plutocrat. So he's not a, a populist, he's a plutopopulist. Essentially, a plutocrat is pretending to be a populist. If you look at the economic policies, they've been all against the economic interests of his uh, blue collar uh, base that voted for him. Uh, his policies on taxation, reducing corporate taxes and taxes for the wealthy. His policies of trying to repeal Obamacare. His policies of loosening up uh, regulation that defend labor and unions. 
His policies about the environment. Everything he has done has been against the working class and the income and jobs of the working class. And he has pretended that if we have a little bit of a fight on trade with China, or if we restrict migration, we're going to resolve the American carnage that we created. But to resolve that, we need inclusive growth. We need progressive taxation. We need to invest into infrastructure, roads, ports, uh, bridges that are crumbling. We have to invest into our green future. We have to do things that provide the workers with the skills and the education that are going to be able to uh, uh, survive and thrive in this globalized and digital world. He has done nothing of that. He has been talking about the infrastructure plan, not a penny has been spent. So he's a Pluto populist. He's really a plutocrat uh, wearing the sheep's cloth of a populist, but he's not a populist. Well, he's been blasting China, as you pointed out. He's been blasting uh, Huawei and, and saying we can't have their 5G embedded into American communications infrastructure or into cities. Uh, and there got to be other choices. But there are no other options that we make these. We don't make these systems in the United States. Europe makes them. But but I'd be interested in 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 where we go with that. When you look at these this next wave of, of to, to a certain degree opportunity, you know, the Internet of Things, vast movement of data that America has no players in it while it's shutting down one of the key providers that's embedded uh, in that business. No, you're right. You know. We need to build a 5G network, but uh, there is either the Chinese one, the Huawei, and we worry about the back door to the Chinese government, but the alternative is only Nokia and Ericsson that are European. And by the way, the Chinese one is 30% cheaper and 20% more efficient. So to build a 5G network without Huawei by having a tech divide between US and China is going to cost us 50% more. And we have lost the technological lead that we had. Of course, we have many private sector tech companies are doing well, but I think that uh, whoever is going to be president for the next decade, we have to think about uh, an industrial policy for the United States. You know, Germany has industrial policy 4.0 for a world that's going to be based on robotics, automation, AI, machine learning, big data, Internet of Things. So this uh, revolution is going to occur regardless of, but we provide people with the skills to be able to be successful. Well, we don't have works that have the right types of skills, and therefore they are in marginalized jobs like hamburger flipping or low-wage low uh, services. So you have to invest into your people, you have to invest into your physical infrastructure, you have to invest into your digital infrastructure. We have a plan. We need a plan to make sure that people can succeed. Otherwise, uh, work is going to be left behind even more than the past. I would advise my viewers to go look at your Twitter stream. I do it um, most every day. And uh, you get snapshots of other subterranean uh, things that could come and, and, and dislodge things. You know, most recently you wrote, uh, you referenced uh, Antarctica. And so it's not just an economic fragility that you're dealing with. We're looking at environmental fragility, even social fragility. and you're predicting that we're going to have a very, very hard decade, that, that we're going to enter in a period which is, you know, catastrophically worse in some ways than the Great Depression. Tell us what you see coming. Well, I do worry that we have the very severe recession that maybe for a quarter, since we start from a very low base, is going to look like a rapid recovery, something like a V. But by next year, it's going to be like a U because there is this burden of private and public debts that are affecting uh, economic uncertainty, risk aversion, and people not wanting to spend very much. And we can have a first wave and a second wave and so on. And therefore, the V is going to become a U, and the U can eventually become a W, a double deep recession, especially if we have a severe uh, second wave, and that uh, W can end up into an L, into a greater depression. And I've discussed uh, in some of my recent writing, there are 10 deadly drivers of disruption and of potentially a depression. We have uh, what I call 10 deadly Ds. One is uh, debt and deficits that eventually are going to lead to default. The second one is demographic and aging that is increasing lots of implicit liability of governments, including those from having to take care of uh, COVID and other pandemics. Then we have debasement of currencies as we monetize large fiscal deficits to avoid uh, deflation. Initially it's deflation, but eventually it's going to be stagflation. We have this digital disruption is going to radically disrupt jobs and income and entire industries coming from technology. We have this uh, 
democracy backlash, as we have a return to populist uh, in power and inward-oriented policies. Uh, we have uh, also digital warfare. The wars of the future are going to be based on cyber warfare, not on conventional war. And then we have uh, these uh, deadly man-made disasters, and I call them man-made rather than natural disaster because there is nothing natural about global climate change. There is nothing natural even about the pandemics. And these pandemics are going to become more virulent in the future. In the last 30 years, we have had first HIV, then we had the SARS, then we had MERS, swine flu, Ebola, Zika, now COVID, and we're destroying, because of global climate change, the habitat of many animals, and then animals are encroaching on other animals, and then they're getting closer to human beings, and they have this zonic transfer of diseases from the animals to human. This is not natural. This is, again, having to do with the destruction of our natural environment. So the combination of all these deadly forces may imply that unless we change radically our policies, we could end up into not just a greater recession like the one we have had this year, greater than the global financial crisis, but with the risk of a greater depression, a depression worse than the one we had in the 1930s. Well, I think one of the questions I have, because, you know, it, I remember the 1990s, I remember working in the Senate, and we had the benefits of a fast-growing IT economy, but you saw people losing benefits. You saw people being asked to live in a turbocharged economy without turbocharged protections. And so this has been going on for quite a while. And so I guess the unfair question is, as you're going very quickly over the cliff, what can stop going over the cliff when so many forces have come together to do that? But I'm going to ask you that. If you were to be in charge and begin looking at how you undo some of the trends that are taking us into this terrible place, what are some of those things we, we could seriously consider? Well, I think the first thing, as I said, that we have to invest into human capital, whether it's globalization or technology, there'll be disruption to entire jobs, skills, industries and firms. So you have to provide the skills to people so they can be able to deal with globalization and with this technological disruption. Everybody should be studying some variant of STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, computing, coding, and you name it. We should start teaching coding to kids uh, as soon as we te teach them English or whatever language they're learning is the language of, of, of the future. Uh, we've had crumbling infrastructures in the United States and rebuilding these infrastructures is going to be important to increase the private sector productivity. We know that global climate change is going to lead to massive cost and losses, and actually many of the technologies that can change global climate change can be uh, labor intensive. If we have uh, solar panels on every building and every home around that, so those are kind of labor intensive jobs, like many other types of green jobs. Uh, Biden had just uh, made a commitment to spend $2 trillion on infrastructure and on the green economy. So we have to invest into our people, in our human capital, into the physical infrastructure, into the green infrastructure, into the digital infrastructure, and also in our institutional infrastructure, because the social capital in the United States is fraying as we have a social division deriving from rising income and wealth inequality by so many people being left behind, becoming angry, alienated, frustrated, and even violent uh, in, uh, in some cases. So unless we rebuild our own social fabric, mm -hmm. we'll be even more divided. So there is a huge amount of investment we have to do to avoid uh, a depression that would occur if we don't do that. I mean, you and I have both been around for a long time, I'm sad to say, but we've been around, we've seen a lot, we've seen protests, and I guess, and, and you know history. And, and I guess one of the questions, when I read your material, I say, well, you know, inequality has been building for a while. We've seen revolutions in the past. We've seen plutocrats and, and you know, oligarchy uh, uh, established in the past. What do you think is making this particular time different than these other moments where we've had protests but not change? Well, it makes it uh, different is that uh, I think that uh, the amount of income and wealth inequality, especially in the United States, a rich level that are really politically and socially unsustainable. And uh, you have both uh, on the right, uh, people that were maybe socially and religiously conservative, they are left behind with barely high school degree. They used to vote for Trump because they thought he was a true populist. 
but they've been disappointed. And of course, even on the left side, the people that voted for Bernie Sanders, for Elizabeth Warren, for AOC, on the Democratic Party are, are looking for change. So I think that uh, uh, progressive mm. policies are necessary because the number of people that are left behind or are losers who are feeling frustrated, alienated, where they worry about their own income, about their own jobs, about their own children, about the future, is rising. The share of profit is rising. The share of labor income is falling. Economic and social uncertainties are increasing. There is not really economic opportunity and social mobility in the United States. Those who have skills and their capital are doing well. Everybody else is being left behind. And it's not just in the United States. For the last uh, year, we've seen demonstration and protests and riots all over Latin America, in the Middle East, in parts of Asia, in advanced economies like in France and Italy, in uh, emerging markets. So I think that we have globally a phenomenon in which there is massive disruption coming from both technology, from trade, from globalization, and there are some winners and there are some losers. And now the losers are becoming a majority and they're either voting for populist parties or they're disrupting traditional establishment parties and they want change. They want a, a world in which capital is not the one who's winning, but labor as a hope. And unless we do it, eventually we'll have social unrest, we could have civil wars, we could have revolutions. That's what happened in the past. So we have to do something to avoid social and political instability. Nouriel, I want to ask you to be a futurist about your futurism, to look past the 2020s and the really gloomy prognosis that you've, you've given this time to the 2030s. Is there someone out there, some nation that impresses you that's beginning to get these show social cohesion questions right, to merge in technology, the trends, that you think will emerge out of that gloom and come in stronger? And I'm really asking, will the U.S. have had its Suez moment? Will another nation or region demonstrate a very different model than we're uh, seeing today? Well, there are some countries that are doing the right things. I think that uh, some of the Nordic countries, the Scandinavian ones, are adopting radically new technologies, like in Sweden, cash has disappeared, payment system are all digital. There is adoption of all these technologies, uh, but they have also a very, very wide social welfare system, so that if you are losing your job, you are going to get education, skills, retraining, your pension, your health care, your free education, and therefore, if uh, just by bad luck uh, you're falling down, you don't have a chance to rebound. So some of the Nordic countries are doing the right thing. Some countries in emerging Asia also have policies like Singapore and others that are investing in the future of their people while adopting technology. Uh, Japan has declining population, but is investing a lot in robotic and automation, and the declining population is going to be compensated by using more machines. So you have to be creative, but provide people the, the skills that allow them to be able to use technology as opposed to having a greater digital divide between the haves and haves not. So th there are models you can work on. Well, Nouriel Rubini, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us today on The Bottom Line, and I look forward to uh, uh, seeing where all this goes, hopefully um, better than you predict, but you know, I, I, I buy your prognosis, and I want to encourage people to check out Main Street Manifesto. It was a real eye-opener for me. Thank you so much. Pleasure being with you today, Steve. So what's the bottom line? There were already bad trends piling up against folks trying to hold their lives together, before the global pandemic hit and destabilized them even more. Some things are never gonna change. The middle class, they're always gonna be squeezed. The rich, they'll get richer. And the poor, even when they do everything they're supposed to do to get ahead, they just can't catch a break. Inequality is gonna remain with us. Pugnacious nationalism is gonna keep rising. Our quality of life is gonna fall as isolationism takes over. And oh yeah, Antarctica is melting. My guest is right that it would take a massive systemic correction to turn around this ship, and the chances of that happening right now are highly unlikely. We're going to have rough waters, buckle up, and that's sadly the bottom line.